Good morning, Father's House Oakland. My name is Derica, and I'm here to welcome you to church. Thank you so much for tuning in today. To start off, we have a few announcements. First off, tomorrow, December 14th at 7 p.m., we are going to host our Discover class, and that's where you can come to discover God's plan and purpose for your life. You can sign up by going to the tfhoakland.org or, and clicking Discover or by emailing us at discover at tfhoakland.org. The second announcement is something real exciting. This Christmas, we have partnered with Children's Hospital and adopted 10 families. Due to COVID-19 restrictions, we will be blessing this family, these families with $300 gift cards to help provide with Christmas gifts, toys, and personal needs for this holiday. If you would like to help, you can donate by giving to We Love the Town in the drop box down below with your giving and tithing. Thank you so much for your constant generosity. We would not be able to partner with these families without you. The next announcement is that please be sure to join us this upcoming Saturday, December 19th. Mark it on your calendars for our Pursuit Mobile as we gather to walk, worship, and pray over our city of Oakland. Check out the announcements at the end for the location and the address. Lastly, we have something called the lobby where we have every week and you can come, get to know us, be part of our community, see where our next steps are, and have a great time. Hope that wasn't too much for you guys. And now it's time to jump into worship. I'm so excited for this one. See you guys after. Bye. Never be on my 
to your praise will ever be on my lips, ever be on your praise will ever be on my lips, ever be on my lips, your praise will ever be on my lips, yeah, your praise will ever be on my lips, ever be on my lips, your praise will ever be on my lips ever be on my lips your praise will always be on my lips always be on my lips your praise will always be on my lips always be on my your praise will always be on my lips always be on my lips your praise will always be on my It's rising now, it's rising now. There's an endless hallelujah. Oh. There's an endless hallelujah from the bottom of my soul. And I will always praise. And it's rising. 
That's why I sing your praise. Ever be on my lips. Ever be on my lips. Your praise. Ever be on my lips. Ever be on my lips. Your praise will always be on my lips. Always be on my lips. Your praise will always be on my lips. Always be on my lips. Your praise will always be on my lips. Always be on my lips. Your praise will always be on my lips. Always be on my lips. Your praise will. Always be on my lips, always be on my lips, your praise will always be on my lips, always be on my lips, you will be praised, you will be praised, with angels and saints we sing away. Angels and saints, we cry, holy, holy, yeah. You will be praised. You will be praised. With angels and saints, we cry, holy, holy, yeah. You will be praised. You will be praised. With angels and saints, we join. Today there's no reason to wait. 
Jesus is calling. Bring your sorrows and trade them for joy. From the ashes a new life was born. Jesus is calling. Oh, come to the altar, the Father's arms are open and wide, forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ, oh, come to Jesus, I'll never forget. We serve a risen Savior.
Every time we travel, at some point, what happens? You want the truth? Yeah, I want the truth. Give us the truth. We fight. We fight. Every time we travel, we fight. Not it could be every time. <laughs> most of the time. Most of the time when we're traveling, we fight. What do we fight about? Um, preference, really. That's, ooh, that sounds like a word in the making right now. Fighting over preference this morning. As we're getting ready to jump into the word, we're going to talk about what does it look like to journey and sometimes how conflict starts in the beginning of every God journey. That maybe what you're walking through right now, there's conflict, but God uses conflict to convince us, to give us confidence so we can step in obedience. Let's jump in. Good morning, TFA Choklin, Pastor Jules here. Thank you for thank you so much for joining us on this Sunday morning or whenever you're watching and experiencing our church service. Uh, it's been an interesting season as the pandemic seems to continue to spread and uh, there's more cases. We are praying and believing not only for a cure and a remedy, uh, but that God will begin to move in our hearts even in this holiday season. Uh, as we're in the season of Christmas, where we're celebrating the birth of Jesus, I, I felt necessary for us to end the year by focusing on the journey that led to Jesus's arrival. You know, for the next three weeks, we're gonna look closely of how Jesus came from heaven, he was parented by a teenage couple by the name of Joseph and Mary, and some of the, maybe even the dysfunction or the humanity that surrounded this couple in their journey to bringing Jesus into life and life on this earth. And we're going to look at this. We're going to hone in because I believe there's so much connectivity and ways that we can be inspired and grow from, but that our deeper level of commitment and faith would, would, would increase, that our faith and our dependency in Jesus would increase in this season. And so we're going to start off our journey with this of being convinced. And so if you're taking notes, we're in week one of the journey, convinced. And we're looking at these stories because uh, as Lonnie and I just illustrated a moment ago, that whenever we go on a vacation, uh, we find ourselves arguing. I mean, it's like clockwork. I just can't anticipate it. Uh, we've been married for seven years, going on eight years in just a few months. And every time we go on a journey, whether it be a road trip or a plane ride or a train, automobile, whatever it takes, whenever we have this long span of time, and I don't know if it's the buildup, the pressure, the packing, Lonnie doing a lot of the work of packing the kids, but we always seem to have this moment of conflict. And words are tossed, and then we come to a place where we realize that if we continue to have this level of intensity, we are going to waste our money. And we do not like wasting money, so we say, let's either get over it, let's resolve it, let's work it out, because we want, the, we want to enjoy the journey. We want to make sure that what we're doing and how we're doing it, that it's actually enjoyable, and we're getting pleasure out of it, and we're making memories. And I think it's no different in our relationship and our journey with God. 
There are moments that we're packing and we feel like God is calling us to do something and that conflict comes to the surface or we get into that argument or more importantly, even as we're trying to make decisions about where we believe that God is leading our family or God is leading our lives and there's moments where we are, we're not quite sure or maybe we're very much convinced that this is what God is telling us and we feel obligated to convince the other person that this is God and we need to make this move. We've, we've experienced these moments and if you haven't if you're new to the team guess what you're going to experience these moments maybe you're going to the holidays and God has been moving in your life and you have to convince your family that of unbelievers that that God is real and that God is moving in your heart well today I want to look at the life of Mary and how she had to walk through this moment of faith and how she was convinced and how that level of confidence moved her to an act of obedience She was convinced that that God was doing something in her life. She was confident, and that confidence led her to obedience. You see, just like Lonnie and I's journeys, when we go on vacation or trips, it starts off in conflict. It's no different with the story of Joseph and Mary, that it starts off in conflict. This recently engaged couple It's being called by God. And just a couple of months prior to this is that Mary had this encounter with an angelic being, an angel, a messenger of God who told her that she would carry the Messiah. Now, you have to understand the Jewish people at this time, they were waiting, anticipating from the day of Moses, from the day of Adam and Eve. They had been anticipating that one day a prince, a a, a ruler would come and bring redemption and bringing alignment to all brokenness, all chaos, all sickness, all disease, all sin. And God comes to this teenage girl by the name of Mary and invites her to go on a journey with God that she would bring the Messiah into the world. And there was a lot of conflict surrounding the immaculate conception of Jesus. And before we dive into the text, let's get a little context of what's going on because we're looking in the book of Matthew, Matthew chapter one. In the story, we have to understand the author is a tax collector and he is taking account of everything that goes on. If you have people that maybe you're a finance major, you know what it is to take account of all that is happening in the dealings. There is a ledger. And Matthew compiles a ledger of the miracles and the works of Jesus. And he starts off with the birth of Jesus. Unlike all of the other uh, books in the Gospels, Matthew goes into detail about how the conflict and he narrates the story through the perspective of Joseph and the struggle that Joseph had receiving Jesus, not as a stepson, but as a godson, that God sent Jesus and he was the father, the Messiah. It starts off with the genealogy of Jesus and it literally goes from this person married this person and they had this baby and this person married this person had this baby and it goes on and it all showcases why Jesus could ever make the claim that he was truly the Messiah. Because it was prophesied that that the king would come through the seed of David. The king would come through the family of David. And literally the book of Matthew highlights how Jesus was born of a virgin's birth. And he comes into this family. And because of this family's lineage, he has the right to assume the throne as the king of kings and the Lord of lords. Now, Mary and Joseph uh, and what they would have looked like now probably would have surprised us. You're talking about being a teenage pregnancy, MTV showcase. I mean, if we could literally go inside the story of Mary and Joseph, not belittling it, not not taking away the holiness and, and how intense and beautiful the story is. But we have to be honest because there is so much explicit conflict in this story that we would rob ourselves of the, the fulfillment, the, the way that faith works. We would rob ourselves of the opportunity to grow from this text. And in Matthew chapter one, we see the beginning of this journey starts off with intense conflict. It says this, Matthew chapter one, verse 18, this is how the birth of Jesus, the Messiah came about. 
His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph. But before they came together, and this text came together means before they got together physically, before there was any procreation, before there was any in between the sheets, before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. Now, let's just pause right here. Imagine this. Literally, the, the story would have, would have played out much like an Indian matchmaker. Two families, they have two, a son and a daughter, and they think they would work out perfectly. So the family engages in, in dialogue. You know, Joe, little Jojo would look so cute with Mary. And imagine what their kids would look like. A dowry is being paid, and, and the two become engaged. And through after a year of being engaged and betrothed to each other, that means they make a legal commitment to be married. The couple is now recognized as husband and wife. They are seen as these two are legally one person. They're a family now. And then they have a ceremony. And this was the three-part process of a Jewish relationship or a marriage. And in the middle of that, through a year of waiting, through finance commit, financial commitment, Mary comes to Joseph, and we don't get an explicit understanding if Mary tells her, this is by the Holy Spirit, hey, I've gotten pregnant by God. But Mary comes to Joseph, and she says, I'm pregnant. And what do you think our boy Joe is going to do? If this happened in 2020, we would say, okay, wait a minute. You're telling me that this is a miraculous uh, pregnancy Check it again. Where did you get the test from? Was it from a Dollar Tree test? I mean, I need to know some more details of how this happened. And Joseph, it goes on and says this. Because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law. That means he was a believer. He was a follower of God. And yet he did not want to expose her publicly to disgrace her. He had it in mind to divorce her quietly. So in the story, we see conflict. Mary gets this amazing news that she is going to be the mother of the Messiah. But this is causing some interruption and interference with the plans that she's made. But she, by faith, accepts the journey that God is inviting her on. And she goes to Joseph, her future husband, and informs her that now she is pregnant. And believe it or not, there was talk going on around town that maybe it was a Roman soldier. There was talk going around town that Mary had been double dipping and making around and doing some things. And literally, she comes to Joseph, not sure of his response. And she tells Joseph, I'm pregnant. And the, ch- the child is most definitely not yours because we've never gone that far. But this is from God. And this baby is to be the Messiah. And Joseph hears this news and tell him, and he's like, you're telling me this is God? Have you ever been in a moment where you had to convince someone that this was God? Have you ever had those moments and those intense conversations, maybe as a husband and wife, where you have to convince your wife that you you heard from God, or maybe you have to convince a leader, or you have to convince your boss, or you have to convince grandma, who's not been a believer for so many years, that, that that this is God, that God is moving in your life. And the level of conflict that comes through convincing someone can wear on a believer. And if we look at the life of of Mary, we see this progression that because Mary was convinced that she heard from God, it created a level of confidence, and that confidence led to obedience. You see, Mary had a confidence that came from God. In this dialogue, Mary goes to Joseph, and what we don't see is we don't see Mary trying to convince Joseph. See, Mary didn't have to convince Joseph because she had to be obedient to what God was calling her to do. Mary had to walk through this, walk this out. And many of us would be perplexed if we heard a story like this. It would be hard to wrap our minds around. And the reason why God had to do it in an immaculate conception is because this story and this text is making reference to the book of Isaiah. And for hundreds of years prior, before Jesus shows up on the planet as an infant or as a, as a little, <laughs> little baby, a prophet spoke up and said that one day a child would be born to a virgin 
Because this Redeemer, this Messiah, had to be sinless. It could not be born through fleshly or earthly or humanly processed, that it had to be of the divine in order for him to be the perfect sacrifice, to be the lamb without blemish, without spot or wrinkle, that what he was going to do, he had to be exempt of the consequences of sin in order for him to take on our sin. And Mary didn't have to convince Joseph. And here's the thing. Joseph wasn't wrong for doubting because he was willing to be wrong. You see, when you're working through conflict, especially spiritual conflict, where one person says, I've heard from God, and another person says, I'm not quite sure. Neither of them are wrong if they're both willing to walk out the process of faith. You see, Joseph who was committed to God and loved Mary, did not want to disgrace her because if he were to divorce her publicly, she could have been beaten. She could have been ostracized out of her community. But Joseph maybe has a a shadow of doubt in his heart that maybe this is God. But he needs time. He needs a moment. He needs God to speak to him directly in order for him to walk out in the same level of confidence that Mary has. You see, in a relationship, especially with a husband and wife, confidence doesn't always mean independence. Confidence doesn't mean that, hey, I operate independently of you and that God can speak to one person. And what we walk through that process of working out those details and allowing both parties to hear and come to the same conclusion that this is God takes time. And you cannot be so quick to make up your mind that you've heard from God and they're just not spiritual enough, therefore voiding them and exempting them of the opportunity for them to hear from God for themselves. If you're going to walk out being obedient to God, spend less time of trying to convince others and being more confident in what God's called you to do. Because when you have a confidence that comes from God, you are not moved or shaken by what you see because you understand there is a reservoir of faith and grace and goodness that is backing you and that God is in this moment. Give it time and allow God to work on the other side. Much like Joseph, who I love the way he responds because I never respond like this. If I feel like my wife is wrong or if I feel so like somebody is not hearing from God, I want to be the first one to inform them that they are wrong and I am right. But none of you would ever feel that same way. But look how Joseph responds. He responds a tough way and he does a tough thing in a gentle way. You see, if we are going to journey into following God, into the places of obscurity and discomfort and seeing the beauty of God bring both parties into a place of faith and understanding, we must be willing to do the tough things in a gentle way. Sometimes being obedient to God and walking out God's faithfulness, walking out the journey that God is personally calling you means you have to do a tough thing. That don't mean you you sever the relationship and blame it on God. God told me, said, I I can't like you anymore. No, no, no. You say, this is not working. And I believe the best thing for us to continue this journey and trusting God may be without each other. Now, if we're talking about divorce, this is a different depiction. There's a process in which the two parties must come to the conclusion and asking and believing. But here's what we see. Two people of faith. Two people working together with the same intentionality of putting God first. How can God bring these two together even though they disagree so strongly? You see, in a community of faith, I see this happen all the time where someone will say, Pastor Jules, I heard from God and he's telling me it's time for me to go. I'm packing my bags. I got to leave. And as a leader, there's sometimes it comes in my heart where I feel like I don't think that's God. And there's sometimes it's flesh and selfishness. I don't want it to be God. I like people sticking around. I like people liking me. And sometimes like, my insecurity can get in the way and I'll be like, well, maybe they're leaving because I'm not that good of a leader. Maybe they're leaving because I didn't build a good enough church. And I can have all of those excuses. But what I have learned is this, is that when people hear from God, it can be very dangerous if they're not clear on who's speaking. But it can even be more dangerous as a leader 
if I'm not willing to walk through a process in which I may be wrong. You see, if you want to journey where God wants to take you, you have to come to a place that you may be wrong. And because you have a confidence that is not rooting, rooted in what you think the situation is going to look like, how you can manipulate this person into being what you want them to be, but your confidence comes from what God has called you to do, you're able to walk in a pace, a pace of faith, a pace of grace. So the question I have for you this morning is where do you get your confidence from? Where does your confidence in the middle of a pandemic and in the middle of all of the stuff that's going on, does your confidence come from a news seat? Does your confidence come from an encouraging post? Does your confidence come from what your spouse or your future spouse or your boyfriend or what your mom or what your dad or your job or what your unemployment check or the new bonuses come? Where do you get your confidence from? Because there are going to be moments where your faith is tested. There will be moments where you are confused and you're not sure if you heard God clearly or accurately that you have to be confident in the process of walking this out into obedience. That here this, this couple, imagine Joseph going to bed that night, realizing that all of this investment, all of this time, and his, 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 his fiance has cheated on him and, and married, knowing that, man, I haven't done anything wrong. I've, I've been obedient. I've honored God with everything that I've done. But how come this situation is unfolding this way? And, and all of my hopes and dreams of potentially being married are now being thrown away because I'm being obedient to God. They both had to trust God and find their confidence, not in each other, but in him. It's amazing that Jesus can separate us and bring us together. Jesus said, I, I didn't come to, to bring uh, candy. I, I didn't come to bring a, a new shirt. I didn't come to bring, he said, I came to bring a sword. Because at some point, when Jesus is involved in our journey, he will separate us from our fleshly and humanly desires and our human understanding and call us to radical, radical faith. Crazy faith. But we read on in Matthew chapter 1, verse 20. Again, this is through the eyes of Joseph. It says, but after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. Mary's turmoil, Joseph's fear. God begins to speak to Joseph directly. It says this in verse 21, she will give birth to a son and you are to give him the name Jesus. And the name Jesus was a very common name at that time. It would be uh, equivalent to Joshua. But this name Jesus is making reference to Emmanuel, which we read. His name will be Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. And all this took place to fulfill, to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet Isaiah. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. You see, in this moment, Mary was convinced. It created a confidence in her. Joseph doubted, but even with a willingness to be wrong, and God begins to meet Joseph on the other side and begins to speak directly to Joseph. And see, what comes against our confidence is, is, is not always external factors, but sometimes it's reasonable doubt. You know, they say that in a court of law that a person is guilty until proven innocent beyond a reasonable doubt. That means the evidence has led us to believe that this person is exempt from any consequence, that this person was not in the wrong, but was in the right, wrong place, wrong time, whatever it may be, the scenario. But because of that reasonable doubt is now removed beyond a reasonable doubt, that person is considered innocent. And you see this. A lot of times when, when God is calling us to, to follow him and to surrender our lives and trusting him in whatever facet that may be, whether it be a relationship or severing a relationship, whether that be moving or staying or whether it means ministering or speaking to a particular family member, whatever it may be, what comes against that confidence is reasonable doubt. You see, a lot of times it's that questioning. 
It's the lack of not knowing what's going to happen. And, and sometimes when we look at the evidence of what's presented to us right now, it kind of creates this fear because we're like, I'm not sure if this is the right decision because it may not work out to look the way that I anticipated. That, that if I be obedient to God, that if I take Mary as my wife, that means people will whisper, people will say things about us. And I mean, God, how do I know that this is really you? The evidence. And it's not always the evidence of what we see in the present or what we see in the future, but it's the evidence of what we know of God's character. It says this in Hebrews 11.1. 1, it says, now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Now, it's interesting because in Hebrews 11.1, 1, the author is using legal terms of evidence. He's saying the breadcrumbs leads us to believe this is the nature and the character of God. And so sometimes God will call us to do crazy, radical, outlandish things. But when we check the evidence, it leads us to a hope and anticipation and faith. Faith is the substance of things hoped for. That means I see the evidence that God is working in the middle of this. And it may not always make sense up front, but I'm trusting this. And this is the difference between faith and optimism, because most people live their lives based on optimism. The world encourages optimism. Hey, be happy. Be joyful. Think positive. You're a beast. You're, you're a sheep. That's a sheep beast. Like, you're going to do it. You're going to take. You're going to kill it. You're going to. It's the world is filled with optimism. And with that optimism is not bad. It's not sinful, but it's not always godly. And it's not always what we should put our faith in because optimism says this. I believe that the potential of tomorrow is going to be good. Therefore, I'm excited. Therefore, I, I'm anticipating that tomorrow looks more favorable than today. The grass is greener. I'm optimistic about this relationship. But there's no evidence. There's no substance. There's no reality to that. That's just our emotional projection of a positive future. But faith says this, tomorrow doesn't look good. Actually, tomorrow looks quite scary. Actually, making this decision, I'm extremely intimidated. Me following God may lead to my death. I may be ostracized out of my family. People may not like me for what I'm about to do. But based on what I've seen in God's nature and his character, I'm confident. Based on what God has done, how I didn't have the resources or the finances to be able to pay that bill and somehow God told someone else to bless me in order for me to complete that, I, I, I did not know. And, and so the evidence leads me to be hopeful. The evidence that I've seen in the nature and the character of God, I'm almost obligated to commit to this. Why? Because he's never failed me. You see, optimism focuses on the potential, faith focuses on the unwavering, unchanging character of God. Optimism says, I believe and hope that tomorrow will be better. Therefore, I should be excited right now. But faith says, no matter what happens tomorrow, I know God will be pleased and I will have been obedient. And the peace of God that surpasses all understanding will be with me as I'm on this journey. You see, many are led by optimism, but aren't convinced of God's character. Many times we make decisions based out of optimism, out of excitement, about emotionalism, because we live in a world that says be excited, and we should be excited. And I think being a person of faith and a part of a community of faith, that there should be a level of optimism. We serve God. We remain optimistic. Optimistic. That's why I think Christians should be the most joyful, the most exuberant, the most expressive, the most outlandish people. Why? Because our faith is contingent upon a person that defeated death. And was on a journey that didn't seem too clean or pretty. But this couple was not led by optimism. They were convinced the character of God. And it says this in verse 24. When, when Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him and took Mary home as his wife. But he did not consummate their marriage until she gave birth to a son. And he gave him the name Jesus. 
Oh man, this is intense. Look at the journey of this man, Joseph, who goes from doubting to believing. He goes from fearful and intimidated to convinced that he heard from God personally. And when he was convinced, it created a confidence and it led to immediate obedience. You see, if you're following Jesus on this journey, as we look at the season of Jesus's birth, as he comes to humanity, just as God called Mary and Joseph, he's calling us to be convinced and unwavering. And that, con- that, that, that convinced, that, that faith, that dependency produces a confidence inside of our souls, but should lead to immediate obedience. You see, there's, I would say there's various forms of obedience. You see, because what Joseph is about to do may not match the scenario and the decision that you have to make but it was personalized for him. And it would have been sin for Joseph to disobey God because God had spoke to him directly. God had made it so clear that this was the evidence that God was calling him to marry this girl. But Joseph responds in immediate obedience. You see, personal obedience works like this. It goes beyond scripture. It's something that is personalized that God calls us to do. For instance, for many years of my life, there were certain movies that I I could not watch. I just felt like this was my personal call that God had invited me on to. For many years of my life, consumption of alcohol, I felt like was a sin. I could not have that, that opportunity. It doesn't mean that consuming alcohol is a sin, but for me and for that season of time, I was not called to do that, nor did I have the liberty or the freedom of that. I felt like this was something very personal that God had called me to do, And it could have been for a season. And in that moment, I don't feel that way any longer. I don't feel like that have those freedoms. And I don't feel like it at least needs to lead to drunkenness and all of those things. But there was a a feeling of this was not my personal freedom that I could indulge in. Maybe because of the past, maybe because of my experiences. But this was a call of personal obedience. Now, here's the thing. When we take our personal obedience What God calls us specifically to do, it's apart from scripture, but God calls us to do. And hey, maybe it's, hey, don't watch this movie. Maybe don't have conversations like this. Hey, maybe don't allow your mind to be entertained by these songs. Whatever God personalizes it, what happens is is this. When we begin to superimpose our personal convictions onto others, then we create religion. And that's sin. When we allow what God calls us specifically to do, if Joseph were to walk around and say, hey, every pregnant girl, you're supposed to marry her because that's what God called me to do. No, 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 no. That's religion. And it's sin. When we take extracurricular biblical activities or the lack thereof and we superimpose those onto others, we add a weight that God never intended. And that's how religion and cults and different denominations can fall into traps when we try to superimpose what God calls us to do onto others. But here's the thing. This was Joseph's personal obedience, and it was difficult, extremely difficult. It wouldn't have been sin until this was made personal to Joseph, until God said, Joseph, this is what I'm asking you to do. And maybe God is asking you to take this journey that may go beyond what you're comfortable with and may even be a sacrifice, may even be letting go, maybe even be denying yourself, may even be letting go of your dreams. But this is the invitation of what it looks like to follow Jesus, that personal obedience. And that personal obedience is always wrapped around biblical obedience. You see, biblical obedience is when the Bible calls us to specific actions and activities that honor God or to refrain from those activities because they honor God. So when it comes to sex before marriage, Joseph and Mary wanted to honor God, so they refrain from intercourse because they wanted to honor God. And this isn't just a weight that we throw on, but God says these are laws, these are parameters, these are boundaries that I've instituted to protect you so that you can honor me freely and that your bodies can be used to honor each other in the confines of matrimony. Or it could be overindulgence. 
Or it could be a lack of, of, of truth and, and you constantly lie or you, you kind of backbite or gossip or the list goes on of areas that are sin to God. And when we omit that from our lives, we're not walking in obedience. We're walking in disobedience. And when we're living in disobedience, it crushes our confidence and our hope and our trust that we have in God. So we refer to optimism. We refer to encouraging quotes rather than having the backing of heaven. You see, when heaven is backing you, no demon in hell, no depth, no no width, no valley, no river, nothing can separate you from what God is calling you to do. And when you're on the journey and you're following God with that personal obedience and you're in that biblical obedience and you're walking with this, not in this religious tug of war, but you're walking in that struggle of saying, God, I'm trusting you. Deliverance is always on the other side. You see, when we try to undermine biblical obedience, we fall into sin. When either of this think that we're the exception to the rule. You know, many times people want to create this, their own journey with Jesus. And they want to make a hybrid journey and they want to, you know, add this area of scripture and cut this out. But whenever we undermine biblical obedience, whenever we come to God and we have our own sense of sexuality and identity and and how we want to relate to anyone for that matter, and it does come, come under the cross, we rob ourselves of truly following Jesus and we create our own version of God. See, for Mary and Joseph, for this journey to commence, they had to be convinced of who God was in their life. And that confidence, that assurance, that that personalized biblical faith led them to obedience. It wasn't blind obedience. This couple struggled. It was difficult. There was death involved. But I love this about Joseph is because Joseph steps up to the plate as a godly man. He does a tough thing in a gentle way. And once he was convinced that God was calling him to do this, he didn't delay. You see, when we delay from being obedient to God's God's way in our life, we create a margin of doubt. Because sometimes when God says, I want you to do this, and when we come to God and say, not now, what we're saying is, God, I don't fully trust you, or God, this is interrupting my journey, my plan. And that delay reveals how much confidence do we have in his character? You see, As we start on this journey and we look at the succession of Advent, the days that approach the birth of Jesus, we're all on a journey. And maybe you're in the middle of a journey with God and God is calling you to take a radical step of obedience. Maybe you've been following God for the last couple of months and you're investigating. And maybe that radical step of obedience is actually the act of baptism. Baptism is a moment where we identify with Jesus, just like Mary had to identify with Jesus. And we're saying new life has been born on the inside of me, that, that God is, is removing the sin in, in my, 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 my carnal or humanly perspective. And I'm a follower of Jesus and I'm letting go of the old life and taking on this new life. I'm now on this journey with God. Baptism is a succession of steps of coming into relationship with Jesus. And maybe that's a radical step of identifying that that flamboyant way where you go into the waters, you you swim at church, you go into the waters of baptism and you come out a new person. Maybe that is your radical step of obedience. Maybe that's the next step in your journey. Maybe it's been the conflict that's been going on in your marriage and you haven't really come to that place of of synergy and connectedness to be able to know if this is God that's leading your family into taking this step. Well, have you created the opportunity for either of you to be wrong? 
Or maybe God's speaking to you, but you've doubted sharing what's going on into a community of believers. You, you've, you've voided yourself of the opportunity to walk in community to say, I believe that God is asking me to do this. God is calling me to do this. And many times it's in community that we even share the most vulnerable aspects of ourselves that God confirms that it is him. And we get to see the evidence. There's so many times that maybe you've done this where you show up into a small group, you show up at church and you are reading a verse of scripture and then the pastor's preaching it, or you were reading this and it pops up in your feed and it's not Google it's not Echo or Alexa sorry if that's popping off in your house it's not any of them but it's God showing you the evidence of things hoped for the substance of faith because of those experiences and sharing those experiences it produces a deeper level of confidence which causes us to walk in obedience to God but if we void ourselves of that shareability of our faith We rob rob ourselves of that confidence. And this morning, as we take the next three weeks to celebrate the arrival of Jesus, we're going to go on this journey together. And I believe that God is going to show us through the life of Joseph and Mary and how they brought the Prince of Peace, the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords into a broken and dark world and how God can do the same in our lives and our singleness and our marriedness, and our datingness, and our craziness. But what is God calling you to do? I want to pray for you. And maybe this is your next step. You're just starting the journey with Jesus. I want to invite you that if you do need to get baptized, it's as simple as going to our website and clicking baptism. For the last couple of weeks, we've had a few names that have popped through of people saying that I have made this decision to follow Jesus. In the next couple of weeks, as we begin to approach Christmas, we're going to create a moment where we're going to baptize as many people that are coming to faith. But we want to encourage you, take that radical step of obedience. Maybe you've never been baptized and you've been part following Jesus for years, or maybe you're recommitting. There's nothing in in Scripture that says you can't get baptized more than once. But maybe you're coming to that place of faith. And it's time to say, God, I'm following you on this journey. Or maybe just lose your right to be right. I want to pray for us and I, as we close. And I want to encourage you, if you need to continue to grow and take that next step, join us in the lobby. We're going to have some leaders there that will be able to walk with you and help you. But let me pray for you as we close. Father, we thank you that you're a God that comes so close to us. That you are Emmanuel, God with us. And Lord, this morning, Lord, even as we're in our homes or in our cars, Lord, I pray that you would give us that level of confidence to that immediate, that radical obedience, that you would move us to take that step of trusting you, however small or great or big or insignificant or overwhelming that it may be. God, we don't want to just be people that are of optimism, but we want to be people of faith, that we trust the evidence of your character that leads us to the ultimate conclusion that Jesus, we will follow you wherever you go. This morning, if you're far from God and you're saying, Pastor Jules, I want to come close to Jesus. I want you to pray this prayer. Just say, Father, I'm in desperate need of you. Just like Joseph, will you begin to cure me of my doubts through your word? Will you begin to walk with me? I let go of of my ideas of this life to follow your son and his teachings. If you pray that prayer for the first time, that's amazing. This is an incredible moment, and we would love to hear how God is speaking to you right now. We want to join you in prayer. If you need prayer, feel free to go to our website or jump into the comments. Or if you're watching church online, you could click prayer right now, and someone will jump in and pray with you. But we want to encourage you that as you take that radical step of obedience, of trusting God, that God is going to ultimately lead you to a place where your faith will blossom and you will see the fulfillment of all of the things that God has brought into your life. That God has this incredible way of working everything that was meant for evil or that caused you harm to good. And maybe you're in the middle of the journey and you've been doubting. This is a great opportunity to connect with other believers as we begin to wind down in small groups in this season and begin to say, hey, I need to grow with other people and walk on this journey together. 
Well, we love you guys so much. Thank you so much for tuning in. Feel free to join us in the lobby and we wanna help you walk with you in making your next step. Uh, if this is your first time here, a great thing that's coming up in the next couple weeks is our Discover class. Make sure you check that out and you get a part of that and figure out how God can use you on the journey with other people in the family of TFH Oakland. God bless you guys. We love you so much and we will see you next week. Hi again. Thank you so much for tuning in to today's word. Hope to see you at the lobby, which is happening right now. You can find the link down below. See you there. Happy Sunday.